Hi everyone, thank you for joining us today. I'm here with Dr. Dieter, who is our Associate Med Medical Director over at David Simpson Hospice House. He is here to clear up some confusion around the often intimidating H word, hospice. So he is here today to provide some insight from questions that we've received from members of the community. Dr. Dieter, thank you so much for being here. I'm glad to be here. So oftentimes the idea of talking about hospice can be scary for patients and their loved ones, leading to a lot of confusion and delay in getting access to care that can really improve their life right away. We wanted to make it easy for members of our community to get the answers they needed to the most common questions regarding hospice and palliative care so that they have the information they need to make informed decisions. So we asked our social media followers, what are your biggest questions around hospice? And we received quite a few responses. I sent those your way, Dr. Dieter. Do you want to kind of go over a little bit of why you believe people are afraid of talking about the H word and your philosophy around this? Yeah, sure, Sabrina. I think this is a really good place to start. Um, so first of all, I've been a hospice physician for over 30 years now, and I am I'm still surprised that some people misunderstand what hospice is and isn't. Um, in it, in realizing um, what I know now, that hospice is the type of care that everyone deserves at the end of life, and that I really think most of us want for ourselves and our loved ones. That's against the backdrop, though, um, that we are in the most death-denying culture that's ever existed. There was a book published in 1974 called The Denial of Death that proves this. Things have really not changed uh, since that time. So, you know, against that backdrop of this cultural death denial um, arises a lot of fear. And um, from the fear comes a lot of misconceptions and mistruths and um, myths actually about what it is and isn't true about um, end of life care. So, you know, I thought maybe the first place I should start is just to, to kind of describe what hospice care is. So a couple key points. First of all, hospice is holistic care, which means that the care is directed not to just the physical or the medical part, but for the whole person, so the emotional, spiritual, psychological relationship part of what it means to be a human being. Um, secondly, this is a type of um, care that is directed for and appropriate for patients that are terminally ill and for their families. We consider the patient and their and their families as kind of one unit of care. The goal of hospice care is to live as long and as well as possible. Mm -hmm. That's the focus. Realizing though that when death does come, that we want to give that patient the opportunity to have the best death possible that they can. Yeah. Um, and so how is this provided? We'll talk more about this in a few minutes but it's really provided by a, a team of caregivers um, that are with that patient and with that family every step of the way because we've been on that journey with so many others before and we we kind of know how it goes. Wonderful. Well, this is great background, I think, on why it's so intimidating and hard for people to really broach the subject. It makes sense. It's understandable, but definitely something that's important to work towards and kind of dropping the fear and being more open because it really is helpful for everyone involved. So one of the top questions that came in right away was who decides or makes a referral when it's time for hospice? A lot of people think they need to wait for their doctor to introduce the idea of hospice or palliative care, or they're just really confused as to how it happens. And that's a great question. I'm glad we're kind of starting with that um, because there is a lot of misconception about this as well. So really it comes down to most of the time um, the referral comes from the patient um, and, and not necessarily in the form of a referral that that we would typically understand in the medical world, that the, the patient will start to feel like um, it's been described to me as I'm in a hamster wheel that I just keep going through the same things in the medical system. Nobody's really talking to me. I'm not getting any better. As a matter of fact, I know that I'm getting worse, 
but right. we're not not really addressing that and I don't feel like I'm getting anywhere. I've been in and out of the hospital multiple times over the last six months. I leave the hospital, I go to a rehab center, I come home for a couple of days and I'm back in the hospital. So a lot of folks unfortunately end up in that kind of situation. And so once they know that that's what's happening, mm -hmm. and they want to have a different way to go forward, that they certainly can make the referral themselves. Um, family members or surrogates, healthcare surrogates for someone that they're caring for who might not be able to speak for themselves can notice the same thing and speak up. So, um, and then where does the physician come in? So um, physicians sometimes who are following patients that have been this sick for so long will offer that and say, you know, I know what you've been going through. Here's an option that you should know about and here's kind of how hospice care goes. Sometimes the physician will make the recommendation to kind of validate what the patient and family are feeling or to let them know something that they don't know about um, further options. The key to this whole thing, Sabrina, is conversation and communication, mm -hmm. is that people need to talk. Patients need to feel that they have the right to speak up about how they're feeling in general and how they're feeling about their health care and how they want things to go. What are their goals of care? So it really, all of those ingredients are important, but anyone can actually at the end of the day, pick up the phone and call the hospice and, and ask for a hospice evaluation. Right, okay, that's great to know, great to know. Here's another popular question. Do you need to go somewhere for hospice? Is it a place? Yeah, so um, no, you don't need to go somewhere. Um, hospice is a philosophy of care. Um, there is a bricks and mortar component to it, which we'll talk about in a few seconds. Um, but basically most hospice care is provided and occurs wherever that patient lives. Mm -hmm. So it could be a house, it could be an apartment, it could be a condo, it could be assisted living, nursing facility, group home. It doesn't matter, the care comes to them. Um, however, Hospice of Western Reserve uh, does have two brick and mortar facilities which are inpatient hospice care houses. And the purpose of these facilities is to provide a place where a patient can get short-term focused care that can't be provided where they live. Right, and I think that's important to note. That's such a benefit to have, you know, when you need additional help in controlling your symptoms that these places are available for care, but that Hospice of the Western Reserve is happy to go wherever you call home, whether that's a hospital or at the time or, you know, a nursing home or just your personal residence. So um, I know there was a lot of confusion around that. So I think that's comforting for everyone to know that it's not a place per se. It's really wherever you call home. And another thing that people asked and I was even surprised about in my own experience with family members in hospice is, who provides the hospice care? It's really not just one person, it's a whole team. Maybe you can talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so um, I'm gonna share a little historical perspective mm -hmm. about where hospice came from because it involves the team and it gives people, I think an idea of why does it take a whole group of people to care for me um, right. and my family? So what happened was um, there was a uh, woman who was a social worker in uh, England in the 1960s. Her name was Dame Cicely Saunders. At the time, she wasn't a dame that was bestowed upon her later, but she was caring for folks who were dying in a hospital, and she realized that back then they weren't doing a really good job of caring for people at the end of life. So she went back to school and became a nurse, then she went back to school again, became a physician. And after she became a physician, she started her own facility called St. Christopher's Hospice in London. That was 1967. That facility, that program is still going, as, as a matter of fact. And what she did was she looked at the current healthcare system and said, what are we not doing well enough for the patients who need us at the end of life? And she actually went back and looked at how care was provided in the Middle Ages in Europe and realized that what we weren't paying attention to are things that we had forgotten with the medicalization of dying. And that was paying attention to the spiritual and the psychological and emotional and relationship part of what it means to be a human being and how important those type of things are when we are at the end of our life. 
So she also realized that if we're going to bring all those aspects of care forward, one person can't do that. A physician or a nurse can't provide all of that. So she assembled a team of, of professionals who then provided care for a patient and their family. She also realized that the caregivers, the family, are an integral part of what's going on with that patient. And particularly if we're looking at dealing with and, and trying to address suffering and pain, that sometimes the pain and suffering is transmitted back and forth between the patient and the ones that they're living with and, and that love them. Mm. And so they wanted really to encompass this whole unit and care for all of them. So that's that's the foundation. And when hospice finally made it over to the United States, we followed that same model. So fast forward to 2020, um, our hospice care teams um, are composed of all kind of highly skilled, very compassionate healthcare professionals with home health aides and social workers and spiritual care providers, nurses, physicians, um, all kind of other folks that provide music therapy and art therapy and all those kind of things. We have sometimes pharmacists that work with us. Mm -hmm. So when you receive hospice care, you realize it's just not a one-to-one -one thing. It's a whole team of people that are on your side and they are there 24 seven to help you with um, everything that you're gonna be facing. Right, and I think that's another comforting aspect. And I keep saying comforting because the H word is so intimidating and painful to talk about, but really once you have the courage and the insight to open the door of conversation, you really will be met with a huge team of people that are amazing at what they do, with their different specialties and provide so much comfort all around for the patient and their loved ones. And it's really, it takes, it takes a while to get to that point, but I think with educating the community about hospice, it takes away a bit of the fear and they will be surprised at all the comfort and peace that hospice can bring for them, their families. You know, it's just, it really is amazing. And we're so lucky to have the talented team members we have that really are there for our patients and their loved ones. and there to support them the whole way through um, and even after with our Western Reserve Grief Services. So it's just it's really a valuable you know, thing to bring to light. Um, yeah. The other thing that I'll add, Sabrina, before mm -hmm. we go on about that is um, listening to you share that reminded me that um, one of the things that makes these teams so um, helpful is that we used to call the teams interdisciplinary teams which meant that each discipline, each specialty, whether it was a home health aide or a physician, kind of contributed to the team, but they were in their own little silo. What okay. has happened over time and when you have highly functioning teams is the development of what we call transdisciplinary teams, which is, it means that we spend so much time with each other in the team that I start to learn what's important in the eyes, through the eyes of a home health aide, in the home health aide starts to learn what's important through my eyes. Mm -hmm. So that for instance, if they're with a patient and family, they'll notice things that need directed to the physician. And so all of the team members are like that. Um, it used to be, for example, when I first started doing this in the early 1990s, that physicians were kind of um, off limits to talk about any spiritual things that went to the chaplain or the spiritual care provider. Nowadays, you know, we all know and physicians that do this kind of work, we're kind of keyed into spiritual concern, spiritual distress. We mm -hmm. know how to screen for it. And so if we start to pick up on somebody's really struggling spiritually, we know then we need to get the spiritual care provider in there right away to help this person struggle with that. Right. And that's wonderful because it's all part of the process. It's all part of bringing peace and comfort to the patient. So that's wonderful. Now, there's another one that people mentioned is that what what are the differences in the hospices out there? Aren't they all the same or is hospice the Western? It, it, there's just a lot of confusion over the differences in hospices. It's either one and the same or something along those lines. And they just kind of were looking for some clarity on are they all the same? Yeah, so the, the basic philosophy is the same of hospice care, but it's like anything else in our society that there's right. different choices. Um, and so each hospice program will um, have their own set of unique things that they do really well. 
um, maybe better than other things that they do in um, a different level or amount of, of services they can provide in those kind of things. So really the best thing, the best advice I can give is for the patients and families that are looking at hospice care is to really do some checking, asking around, shopping, if you will. Um, and that's your right. And you really need to explore, um, you know, what kind of services you're going to get. And don't expect that they're all going to be exactly the same. Right. Some feel like a better fit for you than maybe others. Um, and so we always encourage uh, patients and families, if they are told you need hospice, um, don't let somebody just uh, say, well, this is the hospice that you need to get. Right. You are entitled to look around and see what's available. Right. You have a choice. And I know that our teams are there 24 7 anytime that anyone can call or send an email, you know, but call 24 7 and they will be linked up with a live person who can talk with them about any questions they have if they're doing research or they're just confused. They're here 24 7, no obligation, of course, to to enroll in hospice. It's not like that at all. We're here to provide insight and start that conversation. So yeah, I think that's a great idea. Give a give other hospices a call. Do your research if you have time or just call us and pose those questions and we'll be happy to answer those. That's for sure. Yeah, I now, have to say that, you know, in the in the um, five years that I've been here with my background, other places, um, I am so impressed with how quickly Hospice of Western Reserve responds to right. patient requests, how quickly we get out to where they are, how quickly we answer the phone calls. Um, it, it's just, a, it's, it really um, makes me feel good inside to know that we're able to respond to people suffering so quickly. Right, because like we've been saying, it, it's intimidating to bring up the H word. So when you finally do, and you're ready to go. You don't want to have to wait around and have anxiety and unknown of what's going to begin. I I know from personal experience, they come right in. They start setting up. They start getting to know you. They get equipment in that you need, that you've been too overwhelmed to help your loved one find, or you've been putting off, or you weren't even sure if they need it or didn't know how to introduce. They get it there. They deliver it that day. They're ready to go. They're ready to start. It's yeah. it's. It is very reassuring to know that that's how quick it happens and and not in an overwhelming way and just like a welcoming kind of influx of support that's coming in and you feel like, oh, wow, OK, I'm already feeling the relief and the heaviness taken off. And I think it's really refreshing for people when they see that. Sure. Now, I know that not questions per se, but there were a lot of misconceptions out there and false beliefs that people brought up. Can you kind of get into that a little bit? Yeah, so um, one of the misconceptions or myths that's still out there is that you really need to be on your deathbed uh, to receive hospice services. Um, and once again, that's that's not true. Um, I think there's a couple of reasons for that. One of the reasons um, um, is that some people feel that hospice is giving up, that mm -hmm somehow it means that you're weak or that you're not fighting hard enough and that you might let some people down. Uh, and I know where that comes from and I and I understand that, but what I have come to learn is that it's just the opposite. My experience has shown that patients that um, finally ask for hospice are relieved and comforted and, and so welcome um, our presence and the choice that they've made to, to seek out hospice care that there's, there's no giving up that's, um, that they carry on. They feel like it was the right choice. And oftentimes say, I wish I would have done this sooner. I wish right. I would have waited so long. Um, and, and so, um, you know, we talk about that topic. It also makes me wonder about what else are people thinking if they're, well, if I make this decision and I don't have to wait till I'm on my deathbed to receive hospice care, then how long can I get it? and mm -hmm. kind of what will happen. Um, you know, in order to qualify for hospice care, one of the criteria is that two physicians have to feel that it's likely um, that you will die within the next six months. Um, it doesn't mean that you have to die in the next six, right. six months or that you're going to, but that you're sick enough that that's a possibility. And so many people actually 
um, receive hospice care for those six months and then beyond if they continue to qualify and, and meet the guidelines. So right. that's the initial kind of time frame we're looking at. We're not looking at six hours. We're looking at six months or mm -hmm. so. Um, and then, so what is, you know, what is the type of care or, or, or what kind of happens, you know, when we um, bring the hospice team in? So if you think about it, you're going to get this highly qualified, highly skilled, highly caring group of people who are going to be with you every step of the way. They're going to provide the emotional, spiritual, psychological support, um, no matter what happens. One of the catchphrases we have that we have a lot of catchphrases catchphrases in hospice but you know just meet the patient and family where they are meet their needs with where they are we know kind of where it can go but we're going to address what's bothering you right now in addition to that we provide all of the medications that are related to the terminal illness and and we provide all of the medical equipment whether it's a hospital bed or oxygen or a bedside commode any of those things uh, we kind of bring in and then, um, and this isn't talked about enough, and I know that you mentioned something about this at the beginning, and that is the grief support in the bereavement program. Mm -hmm. And so after uh, a loved one dies, Hospice of Western Reserve will provide and offer ongoing grief support for up to a year um, in caring for families and loved ones that need some ongoing support after the death. I can tell you, um, that there are a lot of people that that when they enter the hospice program and they're the patient and they realize that their families are going to be cared for in this way after they die that that is such a relief and a burden off of their shoulders that that might be the one thing that allows them to have a very comfortable death when the time comes right. knowing that their loved ones are going to be taken care of by this same group of people mm -hmm. that's caring for them at the end of their life Right, that it feels like home already to the loved ones, and it's just the next step in helping to walk through this process and receive that support. And it's amazing the work they do over in our Western Reserve Grief Services with adults, with spouses, with siblings, with children, the Together We Can Grieve camps, and the work they do even with the community at large, with crisis response, with local schools for grief, situations where you know horrible events happen they're there on the ground to help everybody and it's just a talented group of people that really do offer such a valuable service that brings such comfort to the patient knowing they're there and they are ready to go as well mm -hmm. even with anticipatory grief they're there even ahead of time knowing that they're going to need that support and they're there for them with so many resources so it really is a great asset that's for sure so uh, the other um, misconception that's out there that's pretty common um, is uh, that families are concerned that we're going to over medicate their loved one right hospice particularly with the use of morphine mm -hmm. and once again um, i totally understand the concern um, we understand um, the misconceptions about some of the medications that are used like morphine but um, what i can reassure people um, and i do every single day um, is that our hospice expertise, our training, our experience allows us to judiciously use many medications mm -hmm. to treat a whole variety of symptoms, whether it's pain or shortness of breath, nausea, vomiting, anxiety, constipation. Mm -hmm. We kind of know how to use the medications and we are always mindful of the side effects um, and we never, never, never give medications to accelerate someone's dying process. Right. Um, so they can trust and they learn to trust pretty quickly um, that uh, we are going to use the right medication at the right dose in the right setting for them. One of the questions that I know I ask every patient that I see early on if they're having really significant symptoms such as pain or shortness of breath is to say, you know, if it gets to the point where the side effects of the medication that we have to use to get you comfortable, make you sleepy or drowsy. Is that a trade off? Are you OK mm -hmm. with that? Most people say absolutely. It's just I'm OK if I'm sleeping a little bit. So we will discuss the potential side effects with them um, and uh, to make sure that they understand kind of what's happening and why. Right. The last thing I'll say about this is that um, I think the most important medication that we have as a hospice team is not a drug at all. It's ourselves. You know, another catchphrase is that we are the medicine. 
when we show up as human beings um, and and sit with people in their struggles and their illness and their suffering when a lot of other people are kind of running away the power of human presence in being there and showing up um, sometimes is much better than any drug that I that I could recommend for that. Right, right. And so they can count on that. Right. Makes so much sense. Now, I know a lot of people are thinking, OK, this sounds good. This is I'm starting to get comfortable with this, but what what am I going to have to pay for this? Is this covered? And then that's another layer of intimidation and stress for many people, understandably so. So is it covered by insurance? Yeah, um, so Medicare, when it started out in this country, it it quickly was taken over by, uh, or when hospice started out in this country, it was quickly taken over by Medicare. And, and Medicare formed the Medicare hospice benefit. And what that means is that Medicare um, will pay for all of hospice care. And so like everything else in the insurance industry, whatever Medicare usually pays for, it doesn't pay for, the private insurances follow suit. So most private insurances have a hospice benefit at all, as well um, as does Medicaid. So at the end of the day, this is there's no cost for the patient um, and family when they received hospice services. Now, if there's any question about um, expenses that, that might pop up um, extra, you know, kind of around the edges. That's what our social workers are there for, is to help people negotiate, you know, what are some of these other unusual things that might pop up. But the social workers can explain all of this to the patient and family and reassure them. Right. Okay, great. And again, they can call anytime with any of these questions. Right. And pose their specific situation and see what resources and answers we can give them. That's what we're here to do and we're happy to do that. So yeah. just a reminder. And then this was one question that really came through a lot is what is the difference between hospice, the H word, and then this other term that's been thrown a lot out a lot, palliative care. So what's the difference? What is palliative care? People want to know. Yeah, so I've spent the last 20 years trying to explain this to people and <laughs> and sadly there's a lot of uh, physician colleagues across the country that still um, don't quite understand the relationship or the difference. So let me let me try to simply explain it the best I can and point out the differences and the similarities um, with this. So I can remember back in the early to mid 1990s when hospice was really getting its legs and and um, when I would go to national meetings kind of the joke was you know hospice is a wonderful program it's too bad you have to be dying to get it meaning that there's so many wonderful things in this type of care that mm -hmm. you know why can't we give it to other people and in that actually kind of spurred a movement in the hospice community to say why do we have to wait for somebody to have a life expectancy likely less than six months? Why can't we give it to bring this team or this expertise to people sooner? And in kind of the, the metaphor was to move that whole concept of hospice care upstream in the illness. Mm -hmm. So rather than waiting to somebody is as sick as they usually are to enter hospice, let's let's do all this that we're doing for them earlier on. So that's where palliative care came from. And it really, therefore, is a continuum. Hospice is a part of palliative care. Mm -hmm. um, it's just the end part. Right. And so hospice um, blends nicely with palliative care. Um, you can get, receive hospice services without prior palliative care, of course. Mm -hmm. um, and you can receive palliative care somewhere in your illness and then not get hospice care if things level off. So I think that's the relationship part that people need to consider. Um, one of the, in, just in case folks hear this, um, as a patient, sometimes my physician colleagues, um, when someone recommends that a patient should receive palliative care, the physician might say, well, they're not ready for palliative care, um, which is a misunderstanding on their part because everyone's ready for palliative care. And as we talk further, I think I'll be able to explain that a little bit more. Right. Okay. So what does palliative care do exactly for a patient? So let me give you an example. I always use mm -hmm. um, this example to, to kind of highlight the, the main places where palliative care 
um, can have an impact. So let's say I get tomorrow I get diagnosed with cancer um, and I go to see the oncologist and I'm not picking on oncologists or cancer patients. Palliative care is for everyone, but right. cancer is a really common example of the type of patients that benefit from this. Um, so let's say I get diagnosed with cancer. I go to see the oncologist. The oncologist, you know, answers my questions um, and, you know, what kind of cancer I have, what the treatment options are, what the side effects are, and all of these things. Um, in the back of my mind, the probably the biggest question is, am I going to die? Right. Tell me I'm not going to die. Mm -hmm. um, and then yet I'm hearing all this other stuff that will be part of the treatment plan. Um, it can be that first meeting can be some element of palliative care with that oncologist saying, and look, all of the things that we just talked about, if it turns out that your disease worsens, your cancer gets worse, despite all of these things we're going to do, then we're still going to be there for you. And we have a way to take care of you in that situation. Mm -hmm. And so it doesn't really address yet yeah, you're going to die or not going to die, but it reframes that question into the answer that I really want, which is, am I going to be supported and taken care of no matter what? And so that's the first way that palliative care can show up. But then as I go through my treatments, palliative care in the form of a palliative care team, you know, nurses, social workers, um, a physician, et cetera, can start helping me with symptoms that I have from the treatment or the cancer. Um, they can work with the oncologist and the oncology team to treat that. But palliative care can also serve as a guide through all of the decisions that have to be made for me as I negotiate the healthcare system. Mm -hmm. And if I'm weighing, gee, you know, if it gets to the point where they're offering me a certain form of chemotherapy and they're saying that it will buy me so much time, but here's the side effects, I need somebody to talk to about that. Right. Say, you know, which way should I go? What, you know, what, somebody that's experienced with guiding people. And that's where palliative care can come in. So not only helping me with my physical symptoms, but helping me make decisions um, that fit my goals of care. And I think if if we were to wear a T-shirt as a palliative care provider that you know says what we do is kind of superheroes, it's we protect your goals of care. Mm -hmm. And so we will validate and advocate what you want to do and how you want things to go. Because Sabrina, unfortunately, sometimes in the healthcare system, if a patient doesn't say, hey, this isn't exactly how I want things to go, nobody's going to ask them that. And things will right. just keep going like on a treadmill. Yes. Uh, and one thing happens and one thing happens. And then pretty soon they're in a place where they don't want to be. So right. palliative care gives them that other parallel path along with their treatments to make sure that the treatments that they're getting fit what their needs and what their goals are. Right. Really helps them be their own healthcare ambassador and find out, okay, if this is going to give me six more months or another year, but is that year going to be spent sitting in the hospital doing blood transfusion after blood transfusion and then random trips to the ED, which require lengthy hospital stays? Or is there another path that I can go down that my days are enriched and comfortable and surrounded by my loved ones at home where I feel happiest. I mean, that that day is way more valuable than sitting in a cold, sterile hospital room, feeling terrible, sitting there wondering, why am I doing this? Because we're not health professionals. You know, we don't know the ins and outs. So to have somebody that can walk us through that, such a comfort, so valuable. So mm -hmm. that's that's wonderful. So really, when should someone start palliative care? Really, whenever they're given some type of diagnosis or are struggling with a chronic disease really, right? Correct. There's there's no time that's too soon um, right. and it's never too late to, to ask right. for palliative care input, um, no matter what illness you have. Um, right. Or if you're, once again, if you're a healthcare proxy, if you're a surrogate, if you have um, a parent that has dementia um, and you need some help making decisions for them, um, you know, it's never too soon to know what's going to what's likely to show up down the road as far as decisions you're going to have to make. So palliative care can help with that as well. Right. And it's just so important to stress that it doesn't have to be 
this or that option. You can have curative treatments. You can have chemotherapy. You can go through everything you're doing to combat any type of diagnosis or treat it however you want, but with this added layer of support that's there that just helps support, guide you, help with your symptoms. You don't have to make any this or that decisions. You can do all of your treatments with this team that's just there to support and help inform you. Right, and one of the reasons why I tend to use cancer when I talk about palliative mm -hmm. care, we actually have studies that show that patients that receive palliative care along with their usual or standard uh, cancer treatments actually live longer and feel better right. during that amount of time than if they don't have palliative care involved. Mm -hmm. So um, it's an additive thing. It's not a it's not a subtraction. Right, and people can call anytime to add this into their care. Anytime, 24 seven, they can call us, speak with a live person that will walk them through how we can integrate this into their life right away so they have that added layer of support. You know, it's just to me a no brainer once you really break it down. It's just overall a huge benefit for the patient and their loved one, I think, in my opinion. Yeah. Anything else that you want to add? I think we've answered all of our questions and addressed a bunch of different misconceptions. Um, I think not. I think we've pretty well covered it. Great. Well, thank you so much. I think this information will certainly help inform others on this very daunting H word. I think that it will help open up a discussion amongst loved ones and hopefully provide a lot of peace and comfort out there. Uh, for anyone interested in learning more, they can obviously call us at any time. They can go to our website um, or just give us a call night or day be able to get their questions answered right away. So thank you for joining us. And if we'll be posting this on social media, if you have any other questions, please feel free to put them in the comments section. And I know Dr. Dieter will be able to get right back to you with those. So thank you for your time. And Dr. Dieter, thank you so much for your insight. Really meant a okay. lot. That I could help. Okay. All right. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.